pray. Father, thank you for uh, this opportunity to come together and gather around your word and be taught and instructed by it. I pray that you bless this teaching to us for our encouragement and for our good. Um, I pray for our folks who are traveling this holiday weekend that you would keep them safe. I pray for Stephanie that you would cause the surgery that she's going to have to go well, that you give surgeon skill and wisdom and give her a solid and speedy recovery. As this tropical storm slash hurricane bears down on our east coast, I want to pray for folks in Florida, Georgia, Carolinas, all the east coast really, and the Bahamas as well, that you would uh, be merciful to us and dissipate the storm and the strength of it. I've seen you do it so many times, having lived, you know, lived through a hurricane and seeing the wrath that they can bring, Father, and seeing you break up storms. Uh, Father, we pray for your mercy in this case for our East Coast, that you would dissipate the power of the storm, that you turn it away, and that you protect folks, but at the same time, that you would do all your holy will and help us even in difficulties and even, even in disasters to bow the knee before you and to trust that you are all wise, that you are always good, that you are always working for the best for your people and for your glory. And Father, thank you for that. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you use your wisdom to guide us and to instruct us. I pray that you would do so now that you'd be merciful to us, that you cleanse us of all our sins, that you give us hope in Jesus anew this morning. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I'm going to uh, be teaching from Hebrews chapter 12 today. be looking at the first 13 verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And we'll stop our reading there. 
Hebrews chapter 12 is very, very rich and very meaningful, and personally meaningful to me. It's a chapter that I love. And I said last week, the weeks that I have with you teaching, I wanted to address the question, is God mad at me? That's the angle that I'm approaching these texts from. Last week we looked at an answer to that in terms of what scripture shows us about the sympathy of Christ for his people. That he enters into our suffering, suffers with us and for us as the ultimate demonstration of God's love for us. And so the suffering of Christ says God loves his people. He's poured his wrath out on his son so that he, there is no anger toward you if you are a child of God. And this particular text, in addressing that question, is God mad at me? I want to address the subject of discipline versus judgment. So when you feel that God is dealing with you partially, how, how do you address that? How do you see that? How do you, how do you view that? Well, it's very important that we understand even that, that God disciplines his people. That there are times when he will bring troubling and painful things into our lives. But this is not because he's angry at us. It's not him pouring out his wrath. His wrath has already been poured out on Christ. It's him treating us as his children, as sons. Disciplining us. So the Hebrews 12 portrays the Christian life as, as a race. Very famous passage is Hebrews 11, the heroes of the faith have been set before us all throughout, from heroes throughout the Old Testament and their enduring faith. And he says, now you have this great cloud of witnesses from Abraham to Samson to David and beyond. Now run the race. They ran the race. Now you have to run the race. Well, running the race is not easy. He's setting this up to say, this is not, this is not easy. As a matter of fact, you know, he calls them a cloud of witnesses. These other race runners who've gone before us, and some of you may know, you know in Greek, the word witness is martyr, essentially. A witness is a martyr. A witness is somebody who's willing to die for their testimony, for, for their faith. And, and many of the people that, he, he mentions people in Hebrews 11 who literally were killed for the faith. He says, look at their lives. This is not going to be hard, but as they endured in this race, God is calling you to endure. Uh, and the word race itself, again, this is in verse 1 of our text, in Hebrews 12, 1. The word race in Greek, another beautiful one, is agonia, which we, you know, we get the word agony from this. It's, it's going to be agonizing at times. At time. It's, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be possible. Hard, but possible. So how are you going to do it? That's the question. And his answer, you know, well, at least two things I want to point out from the text that he answered. How are you going to run this race of the Christian life when God is disciplining you at times? And it's a struggle. How are you going to run this race and keep going to the end? And two answers here. Number one is, fix your eyes on Christ. And number two is, remember that you are a child of God. And go to school like good children do. <laughs> so number one, he says, fix your eyes on Christ. Look at verse 2 in the passage. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Then he says in verse 3, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So he says, look, and he says, consider. That's, that's his imperatives there, his commands there. Look at Jesus, look to Jesus, consider Jesus. When things get hard, what do you do? Look to Jesus. Well, no, you, you complain, and you whine, and you groan. His answer, no, you, that's not where you start. Start by looking to Jesus. Literally, fix your eyes on Jesus. I think that's how the NAS translates it. Fix your eyes on Jesus, and it's present, and it's active. He's saying, always be doing it. Always be fixing your eyes on Jesus. This, you know, the hymn 
puts it, turn your eyes upon Jesus with full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that's what the author of Hebrews is saying. When life is hard, things, the things won't grow dim until you fix your eyes on him. Or I mentioned Thomas Goodwin, who I'm, I'm using for some of my material for this brief series. Thomas Goodwin, uh, who's a Westminster divine and Puritan, he said the Christian life consists of a habitual sight of Jesus Christ. It's looking at him. And I always qualify that, and I've said it, I've said it here in, in my time in Stevens Valley. Um, I like to use that phrase, look at Christ, look at the cross. And I had a lady after church one day in Mississippi say to me, you keep telling me to look at Jesus, look at the cross, and y'all don't have any crosses hanging in the building. So how am I supposed to do that? And she made it. And she grew up Roman. She told, went on after we had the conversation. Went on telling me she grew up Roman Catholic, and having objects to focus on were very important. Well, the author of Hebrews is calling us to a spiritual side of Christ. It's something that happens in the heart. It's something that happens in the imagination. It's something that happens in the soul. However you want to look at it, it's putting the cross before you. It's it's putting Jesus' sufferings and and his life before you. It's thinking. It's considering those things. It's thinking deeply about those things. Looking, fixing your eyes spiritually on Jesus. Uh, to illustrate that, one of my, probably my favorite illustration of this idea of looking at, at Christ is the testimony of the conversion of Charles Spurgeon. If, I'll take a survey. How many of you heard, have heard Spurgeon's conversion testimony? Yes, this is going to be great then. <laughs> Spurgeon is... So I want to set this up. He's a teenager, young teenager. It's a, he, he goes to church. His grandfather was, was a minister. Uh, one, but he, he, he feels lost. Uh, he, he's not a believer at this point. And it's a snowy day in England. And he's, he's trying to get to the church that he normally goes to. And it's, it's snowing so hard, he says, I don't think I can make it. So he kind of ducks around a corner and sees a little primitive Methodist chapel. And he pops into this primitive Methodist chapel and sits down. And there's just a handful of people there. And because of the snow, the person, their, their normal minister couldn't make it. So they just had a layman uh, up to give a, what they called a word of exhortation. Not an official sermon, but, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of exhorting, they, they would have called it. And, uh, and the guy who, who's giving the message Spurgeon said was just, could barely talk, he could barely string two syllables together. He was not an educated person, uh, highly educated, but nevertheless, he gives his word. And I'll, here's, uh, I'll read, this is from Spurgeon himself. He says, I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair until now, had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning while I was going to a certain place of worship. I turned down a side street, came to a little primitive Methodist church. In that chapel, there may have been a dozen or 15 people. Imagine the great, this guy who went on to be one of the greatest preachers who ever lived is going to church with 12 people on a snowy day in a little Methodist chapel. It's great. In that chapel, there may have been a dozen or 15 people. I had heard of the primitive Methodists, Methodist, how they sang so loudly that they made people's heads ache. But that did not matter to me that morning. I wanted to know how I might be saved. The minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. At last, a very thin-looking man, a shoemaker or tailor or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. Now, it is well that preachers be instructed, but this man was really stupid. He was obliged, obliged to stick to his text for that simple reason, uh, that he had little else to say. The text was... Isaiah 45, 22, which says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in that text. The preacher began thus. So Spurgeon recollecting the actual message. This is a very simple text indeed. It says, Look. Now looking don't take a deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It's just look. Well, a man needn't go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, but you can look. 
A man needn't be worth a thousand a year to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. But then the text says, look unto me. I, he said in broad Essex, many of ye are looking to yourselves, but it's no use looking there. You'll never find any comfort in yourselves. Some say, look to God the Father. No, look to him by and by. But for now, Jesus says, look unto me. Some of you say, we must wait for the Spirit's working. You have no business with that just now. Look to Christ. The text says, look unto me. Then the good man followed up his text in this way. Look unto me. I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I'm hanging on the cross. Look unto me. I'm dead and buried. Look unto me. I rise again. Look unto me. I ascend to heaven. Look unto me. I'm sitting at the Father's right hand. O oh, poor sinner, look unto me. Look unto me. Spurgeon continues. When he'd managed to spin out about ten minutes or so, he was at the end of his tether. Then he looked at me under the gallery, and I dare say with so few present, he knew I was a stranger. Just fixing his eyes on me as if he knew all my heart, he said, Young man, you look very miserable. Imagine your preacher telling you that during a sermon. <laughs> well, I did, Spurgeon says, but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made from the pulpit on my personal appearance before. However, it was a good blow, struck right home. And the preacher continued, and you will always be miserable, miserable in life, and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then lifting up his hands, he shouted. There's 12 people in the room, y'all. <laughs> he shouted as only a primitive Methodist could do. Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. Spurgeon says, I saw at once the way of salvation. I know not what else he said. I did not take much notice of it. I was so possessed with that one thought. I've been waiting to do 50 things. But when I heard that word, look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could have almost looked my eyes away. And I would dare say that's what Spurgeon spent the rest of his life doing, <laughs> looking, looking and living and he's still living because he obeyed that text that day he looked to jesus and the author of hebrews he's telling you fix your eyes on jesus mm -hmm. he's the only way look to him he says in verse three consider him consider him literally analyze him <clears throat> think deeply about him i remember years ago when i was a new christian listening to a sermon that uh, was a church and I'm listening to a sermon and the pastor I don't remember what the text was but I remember he said we were singing when I survey the wondrous cross that day and he said have you ever thought about those words when I survey the wondrous cross he said survey I knows every inch a surveyor knows every nook and every cranny and he's saying get so familiar consider the cross consider the, the work of Christ so deeply look to it so often that you know its nooks and crannies and, and every inch of it. When you're tempted to think God is angry at you, think of what the Son of God went through on that cross for you. That he took the full brunt of God's anger on himself so that you would face none of it. One of my favorite Spurgeon lines, it's kind of a Spurgeon day today, I remember reading a sermon of his on Noah's Ark and he said, when Noah was inside that ark, not one drop of water can, could touch him. And when you are inside the ark that is Jesus Christ, not one drop of God's wrath can touch you. Because he took it all on himself. Last thing I'll say about that, and it's point one. I'm not going to ask you to flip, but back in Hebrews 2, 
one of my favorite lines in the whole, I spent six months teaching through Hebrews or eight months or something like that, and I, I've come to love a lot of these passages. And one of them is Hebrews 2, 1. He says, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. It's sailing metaphor, boat metaphor, apostasy, falling away. He likens it to drifting away like a boat that hasn't been anchored, and that's what happens to you. You don't have a solid anchor. Well, you tend to drift. The tide comes, it pushes you around, next thing you're lost at sea. And he says that's what falling away is like. That's what happens if you don't have a proper understanding. When hard times happen, when tough stuff happens in your life, and you don't understand the discipline of God, you get bitter. You get angry. Next thing you know, you look up, you look up and drift it. He says, to keep that from happening, you must pay much closer attention than what you've done in the past. And literally, I, I saw one commentator when I was studying this who said, you could translate that, pay much closer attention as, be obsessed. <clears throat> be obsessed with what you've heard, lest you drift away. Be obsessed with the gospel. It should be a passion. It should be an obsession in your life. That's the anchor that's going to hold you. I mean, you think about the New Testament and you've got the Apostle Paul. Some think he wrote Hebrews, some don't. It doesn't matter. It's, it's scripture. That's all that matters. But uh, I think of Paul, he would say things to the Corinthians like, I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, there's a lot of stuff to talk about in the world, isn't there? I mean, Nero was persecuting Christians all over the Roman Empire. You, know, you could get in the political realm. You could get in the philosophical realm. There's so much to talk about, Paul. And he says, I'm, I'm just here to tell you about Christ. Spurgeon called, Spurgeon preached a, a sermon on the text of Paul. He called Paul the man with one subject. That was the name of the sermon. For I like to say, I would tell my people with the church that <laughs> I, I pastored and preached weekly, I would say, you know, I'm Barney Fife in this pulpit. I got one bullet in my gun. And that's Jesus. <laughs> That's all we have, and that's all we have as a church, and that's all that we have as people. So when you are tempted to think God is angry with you, when struggles and trials come, the first answer is fix your eyes on Christ. The second thing he says is, remember that you are a child of God. And like I said, like a good child, you got to go to school. <laughs> it's part of being a child. He's very fascinating in the text, in, in uh, verse 5, Hebrews 12. He says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not despise, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. You see what he does there? It's really interesting. He's quoting, some of you will have, like my Bible has an indentation to show you. This is a quote he's about to get to. He's quoting Proverbs. The proverb in the book of Proverbs says, My son, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. That's Solomon literally talking to his son. He's training future kings of Israel for how to live a wise and, and godly life, to be, be a good king. And now the author of Hebrews says, No, no, no. That's not just Solomon talking to his sons. Ultimately, it's the true king, the great king, the higher king, talking to all of his children. The Proverbs address you just as much as they address the sons of, of the kings of Israel, of Israel. So son becomes you as a son. And that's good news, that, that's good news for the women in this room. Because, I would, you know, it's, it's, you have to be sensitive about this stuff. But why is it important that he calls us all sons of God? It's important because if you look at the inheritance rights, inheritance rights in the Old Testament, who got everything? Well, the oldest son, right? And he says, now, all of us are treated as if we were oldest sons because our older brother, the true son of God, Jesus, came and lived and died for us. So we're all counted as sons of God, as children of God. And as such, he says, if, so think about it logically. If you're a child of God, what do good fathers do to their children? Well, they love them, yes, but they discipline them. They don't just let, I don't let my kids run across the street when traffic's coming. I yank them by the arm and pull them back. You're not a, Daddy, that hurt. Because there was a purpose behind it. You know, I promise you. Uh, so discipline, he, he focuses on, so, 
in terms of people falling away, one of the things people really struggle with is, is the disciplining hand of God. That I'll give you a shout out. One of my church members used to say you know, that God can make a wicked lick with a crooked stick. He can, he can come down at times. And it, or at least feels like he's coming down on us. But the author said, just remember, you're a child. He has a purpose in this. That word where he says, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. It's a word that's used several times in the New Testament. Paul uses it in Ephesians 6, talking to parents, to fathers. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The same word. Discipline. Uh, he disciplines us as a perfect father trying to mold and shape his children. And that means it's not done to provoke us to anger. And it's not done from anger on his part. Instead, he's trying to mold us for good. I, I mentioned last week when my friend who preached a heavy sermon on God's wrath. and his, uh, He was an intern at the time. And the senior pastor says to him, uh, you think God's angry at you? Because you're pretty intense. <laughs> and I don't think you can keep that intensity up from week to week. And my friend said, no, God, I don't think God's angry at me. But secretly, as my friend's telling me this in my heart, I had the sneaking suspicion that God was angry at me. You know, I didn't become a Christian until I was 19 years old. I was raised up in a household that was not Christian. Did some pretty crazy things. Had a lot of guilt and shame that drove me to Jesus and... It took me a while to grasp that the cross actually, that Jesus paid it all as, as the hymn said. I thought there were still parts that maybe I was <coughs> paying for, so this had a big impact on me. And when bad things would happen, you know, if I get a flat tire on the way to work, I'm just like, oh, God hates me. He hates me. You know, anything. The ups and downs, you know, it's a good day and there's sunshine in my soul and Jesus loves me, this I know, and then I, you have a rough day and it's like, hey, he's turned his back on me. It's, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's very easy to fall into that. And after that, after that I started thinking about God's anger toward me because of my friend. Uh, I read a book called The True Bounds of Christian Freedom by Samuel Bolton. I still count it as one of the books, uh, probably top three books that impacted my life and, and all my Christian life. Wonderful book. And he makes this one point. I'll, now, I'm reading a quote. Let me just set it up a little bit. because You don't understand how exciting this, this is to me. I remember reading this book as a seminary student who's supposed to know this stuff. And I literally remember laying in my bed one night, and it's the middle of the night, and I'm reading this old Puritan writer. It's a Puritan paperback by Banner of Truth. And this thrills me so much. I jump out of bed and I'm having to refrain from just shouting like hallelujahs and the like. Because it, it's just... You know that line from the Wesley hymn, he says, My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose before the fall. The, I hope you've had experiences like that in your life. Like, I don't think that just happens once. <laughs> you know, it happens it happened at the beginning, but there, like, I can remember half a dozen moments in my life where, where that happened. And Samuel Bolton called call us one of them because he said this. He said, under the gospel, God looks not upon the weakness of saints as their wickedness, and therefore he pities them. Sin makes those who are under the law the objects of God's hatred. But sin in a believer makes him the object of God's pity. Men, you know, hate poison, he says in a toad. Snake would probably be a better image for us in 2019, so we'll say snake. Men, you know, hate poison in a snake, but pity it in a man. In the one, it is their nature. In the other, their disease. Sin in a wicked man is poison in a, in a snake. God hates it and him. It is the man's nature. But sin in a child of God is like poison in a man. God pities him. He pities the saints for sins and infirmities. But hates the wicked. It is the nature of one, the disease of the other. He says, so when God looks at those who are not in Christ, sin is venom. 
and snake. It's loathsome. It's vile. You see a venomous snake, what, what do you want to do? Either run away or chop its head off. But when you see a man who's been infested by that venom, a man who's been bit, you want to chop his head off? No. You want to get him in the hospital. You want to get him an antivenom. You want to get him help. And Bolton says, see, poor sinner, when you're a child of God, when, you, when your sins have been atoned for by Christ now, you're a man with venom. God pities you. He wants you in the hospital. He, he wants to care for you. He doesn't want to cast you off and chop your head off and pour wrath out on you. Instead, He pities you. And as such, even when you are in sin, even when you are in, in the sort of rebellions that maybe we fall into from time to time, He's going to use in His pity, He's going to use those bad things for your good. Ultimately, you know, Martin, Martin Luther, uh, the reformer, uh, called it the seminary of suffering. He's going to turn your sufferings into a seminary. That's what it, he's going to do in his pity. He said, uh, Luther, in his commentary on Psalm 119, said, I want you to know how to study theology in the right way. This is valuable information, right? we got Martin Luther, one of the greatest theologians who ever said, he said, I'm going to teach you how to be a good theologian. I'm going to teach you right now. This is what he says. I've practiced this method myself. In Psalm 119, you will find three rules for being a good theologian. They are frequently proposed throughout the psalm and run like this. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. That has a nice ring to it, but we don't know Latin. So prayer, meditation, and suffering. He said, if you want to be a good theologian, pray often. Meditate, especially on the cross of Christ. Think deeply about what Christ has done for you. And then lastly, he says, suffer. <laughs> Psalm 11999. Uh, we had we got Hebrew t-shirts when I took my Hebrew class in seminary. It said RTS Hebrew on the front of them that had a Bible verse in Hebrew on the back. And uh, we had Psalm 11999 in Hebrew on the back of our shirts. It said, it says, I have more understanding than all my teachers because your testimonies are my meditation. Our teacher used to say, you want to be smarter than me, then meditate more on the Bible than I do. That's meditation. But suffering, Psalm 11967 says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Seminary of suffering. Psalm 11971. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The psalmist saw suffering as an instructor to bring him back to God and help him to learn obedience. Roundabout way back to Spurgeon before we wrap up. When Charles Spurgeon, that, you know, look at me and live. When he saw suffering in his life, he kept looking. He kept looking at Jesus. He kept fixing his eyes on Christ. And a couple of quotes, he said, It would be a very sharp and trying experience to me to think that I have an affliction which God never sent me, that the bitter cup was never filled by his hand, that my trials were never measured out by him nor sent to me by his arrangement of their weight and quantity. I'm afraid that all the grace that I've got of my comfortable and easy times and happy hours might lie on a penny. So all the good I got out of my ease, like that. Then he says, But the good that I've received from my sorrows and pains and griefs is almost incalculable. Affliction is the best bit of furniture in my house. It is the best book in a minister's library. See that seminary? of suffering. He viewed it as a school. The best book in his library and in any minister's library. But here's the thing. It's not going to be a healthy book in your library if you're not doing point one. Looking at Christ. Now, like, <laughs> that minister said to him on that day, if, if you only look at yourself, no, don't be looking at yourself. There, you know, there's no good looking there. No, no, no. Look at Christ. 
Look at him sweating great drops of blood hanging on that cross. If you don't, you'll always be questioning. You'll always be looking, you know, it's like looking over your shoulder like God is just creeping up to get you. I always quote that. His old spiritual, but Johnny Cash covered it and sang it. He said, sooner or later, God's going to cut you down. That's gone from our language. He cut Christ down so that he will never cut us down. And you have to fix your attention to that, especially in hard times. That's what's going to keep you going. Uh, Fred Craddock, who has passed away, but he was a disciple of Christ minister, told a story that um, I thought it moved me. I thought it was interesting. He said, he claimed this was a true story, that he talked to a man who uh, became a minister, but he had no arms from childhood. And one day, as, as, as a boy, his mom, the, the young boy's mom, decided, well, he's got to start learning to take care of himself because I, I can't take care of him all his life. And so he, she sets his clothes on the bed one morning and says, you've got to dress yourself today. Well, I have no arms. How am I going to do that? And the boy, his mom, I can't. It's too hard. And she says, son, you've got to. you got to. And she walks out of the room and shuts the door and just leaves him there by himself. And uh, so he starts yelling and throwing a tantrum. Dress your, he says, I can't dress myself. She says, you have to dress yourself. And this is Craddock. He says, he kicks, he screams, he yells at his mother. You don't love me anymore. Why are you doing this to me? And this goes on for minute after minute. He's crying, he's sobbing, he's yelling, he's kicking and screaming, and then he realizes, well, she's not coming back. I better figure out a way to get dressed. And he does, somehow. Somehow, in his wriggling and writhing, he manages uh, to get his clothes on after an extended period of time. And he gets to the door to come out and his mother is waiting there and she opens the door for him and she's sobbing now. She's crying. And he just falls into her arms and they cry together. What was the difference of that boy on this side of the door versus when that door opened? But well, he couldn't see his mother on this side. He couldn't see her. I want to just want to say from this text this morning that part of the beauty of the gospel is that when we're writhing and screaming and we thank God's anger with us, when we think that he's not being fair to us, when we think, you know, like we're like people with no arms and we're just struggling through life, the cross of Jesus Christ, look, 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 it shows us. So we talked about last week. He, he came and wept for us. Jesus did. God, the second person of the Trinity, came and wept, came and bled, came and suffered, came and died. So when you're on the other side of that door and you feel like you can't see him, look, you have nothing to do. You have nothing to do. You could do try to do 50 things. You have nothing to do but look and live. That's the message. And, uh, I will stop there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy to us. Thank you that he promises us he will never leave us or forsake us. That he walks in the midst of the lampstands. That he sees everything that we endure. That every tossing and turning, lo, the psalmist says, you've kept count of my tossings and my tears are stored in your bottle. You know every trial. You know every tribulation. You know every pain. You know every groan that we go through and you love us and you care for us and sometimes you will bring hard situations into our life because you're molding us, you're disciplining us, you're trying to conform us into the image of Christ which is our ultimate hope that what, he, what we will be is not yet appeared to us but we know that when he appears we will be like him or we will see him as he is. Well, Father, we will look and live in glory, but help us to look and live now and help us to keep enduring as uh, 
this overarching message of Hebrews is teaching us. We ask it all in Christ's name.